I'm really grateful to be joined by Danny Pritchard, who's the Deputy Lead Chaplain at James Paget Hospital. Uh, Danny, hi, how are you doing? Hello, Peter. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, good. end of a week, but I'm good. Yeah, how, how's things going with the, the, you and the rest of the chaplaincy team at the moment? Well, it, it's going well, but we're very short-staffed, as you, as you probably know. Um, none of our uh, volunteers or bank chaplains are able to come in at the moment, uh, mm. mainly because of them uh, uh, either um, in the age bracket that makes them vulnerable or they've got right. health conditions yeah. and they need to uh, keep their distance. And actually, because it's so hard in any case to visit in the way that they're used to, um, it, it wouldn't be very easy for them to operate in the way they normally would around the hospital with the distancing and isolation issues. So it's really a, a skeleton team of chaplains <laughs> picking up all the slack. Yeah, it's Alan and myself full time, uh, Stephen Andrews and uh, Father Al- Alvin Ibe from the Catholic Church uh, are helping us part time. Both absolutely fantastic, doing a great mm-hmm. job. Mm-hmm. And Alan um, holding us all together, leading the way. <laughs> As he does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, how, how, so think more widely amongst the staff in the hospital. How's morale at the moment? Uh, it's, it's very mixed, uh, Peter. I think. Um, with these sorts of pandemic situations, things go in phases. And Mm -hmm. and initially, um, you know, there was some sort of anxiety and uncertainty about what would happen here. And as the East caught up with what's going on elsewhere in the country, uh, you kind of get this reaction of everybody throwing themselves into things with enthusiasm, everybody going the extra mile, great deal of cooperation and, Mm -hmm. and so on. But it quickly starts to tell on people because as well as being medics and uh, cleaners and uh, porters and all sorts in the hospital. They're also mums and dads, and uh, they have elderly parents. They have loved ones. They're anxious for their own health. Um, cool. You know, they've got partners whose jobs are insecure, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So they're they're bearing the brunt of the crisis in the hospital, but they're also feeling it just like everybody else outside. So uh, people are doing amazingly well, but inevitably anxiety levels are starting to. To grow. Mm. I, I've wondered um, the the applause that people are doing on Thursday nights um, out on the streets. D- does that have an effect on staff in the hospital? Does it affect morale, or, or, or is it well received, or are people just carrying on and kind of yeah. unaware of what's happening? No, I think they're very aware. There's been a, there's been a lot of fantastic support to um, the pageant from the local community, an awful lot of donations. Um, people bringing food for folks who are uh, working late and through the night, people who are in the intensive care department and other areas. And, um, you know, gifts of cosmetics and all kinds of stuff that's blessing and encouraging people as well as patients. So there's a, there's a strong sense that the community out there are really rooting for the NHS. Uh, We, we get involved. Um, Alison, insists that I go to the door every Thursday at eight o'clock and <laughs> yourself. <laughs> a little close all join in and um uh it's it, it's even fireworks where we are we wow <laughs> it's the, the evenings they, are, are they nice. spilling out Danny in the sky are they these fireworks <laughs> we kind of hear them but don't see them because the evenings are getting lighter but uh, yeah it was fireworks for a few weeks but yeah it's a great encouragement to to staff to know that the community are, are absolutely rooting for them Within the hospital, what are the biggest challenges for you as chaplains at the moment? If if we visit patients at all, it's usually only very critical situations or end of life. And and that has to be done with enormous care. You know, Mm. the the, the, um, chaplains who attend have to use the the full PPE. They have to wear the masks and the visors and everything else, um, especially in the critical situations. Um, but it, it, it's become all the more important because many of those people can't have family visiting them. So the fact that a chaplain can be there, I know um, once or twice uh, Alan and Stephen have, have attended end-of-life situations and mm. uh, prayed with people at the very end, um, what, what some would call the last rites, but, you know, mm. just blessing and praying for them in their last moments. And sometimes family can't even be there. So our, our freedom to work on the wards is greatly restricted. One of the one of the reasons is that we don't want to be using PPE for a five minute visit to someone which someone else could use for a five hour session. Yeah. So there's there's been some hesitancy about about that. And 
even our presence on the ward can be challenging for the staff who are trying to work, um, you know, and then need to facilitate us and, and look after us as well. Mm. So it, it is challenging, but inevitably the shift has been towards staff support and uh, morale and, uh, you know, helping to meet some of those anxieties. So we spend a lot of time informally just talking to staff in the corridors around the um, around the building, uh, going to the, the office areas and the, the corridors um, that lead down to the ward. You'll know where I mean, Peter. Yes. Um, where, where various people who are the managers and the, um, the senior uh, staff have their offices. So we're doing a lot of sort of personal support in that way. An awful lot of just informal conversations in the corridor mm. um, with, an I just think, an increased desire to chat on the part of staff, just to offload, to talk about how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and then considerable amount of intentional one-to-one -one, uh, sit-downs with people who um, are feeling personally very damaged by this. Um, you know, we have staff who've lost loved ones. We have staff who are um, grieving, staff who can't see um, elderly parents or can't visit their grandchildren, staff who've moved out of their homes because their partner is uh, needing to be shielded. Mm -hmm. So they're living somewhere else. All kinds of situations that are causing a great deal of sadness and anxiety. It just sounds like you need a incredible um, wisdom and judgment in, in, you know, like you say, when to when to use up that valuable PPE equipment, when to uh, uh, to go into the one of the wards and to, to visit a patient. And but it, but it also seems like you're really being the, bringing the peace of Christ into the whole hospital, bringing that sort of that sense of reassurance and and um to to those that are worried and, and anxious and, and and fearful i mean i absolutely hope so we we pray for that every day we we uh, you, you know you you mentioned praying for us and i, I was thinking about the um, story the other day of aaron and her uh, holding up the arms of moses um, yes. and we do feel that at times that people are holding up our arms as we're trying to cheer on the the people who are in the front line yeah. um but yeah i the, the wisdom um, and it, perhaps putting it slightly differently, the direction of God in it is so important. Mm. And Stephen and I were praying this morning before uh, before we started work uh, that that we would really know the leading of the Holy Spirit because it's a huge hospital. There are loads of people who need our help. You could just go out there doing what you do, but the sense, wanting the sense that the Holy Spirit was leading us step by step. Yeah. was very much on our hearts this morning mm -hmm. just wanting to know that we're in the right place talking to the right people and not surprisingly it, it's uh, it's not unusual to find that we turn a particular corner and meet the very person we need to be with and need to be supporting or we're down at the chapel at just the right moment mm -hmm. when somebody comes by it happened a couple of times to me today and I know it is for others that mm -hmm. you meet someone and you you ask the leading question how are you how are your loved ones are your family all right and the next thing is sitting down somewhere quiet, having a heart to heart as they pour out their situation. How might we, all of us that are watching this, uh, kind of pray uh, for you, for um, our key workers, and particularly things that perhaps we overlook? Uh, people often think, oh, we'll pray for the doctors, pray for the nurses, maybe even pray for um, um, the cleaners, the, uh, all the domestic staff, porters. Yeah. But, you know, talking about specifics, like praying for direction, uh, God's direction for you as, as a chaplaincy team of, of where to use your time and where to go. And, and are there other things that we might, um, you might find useful in terms of uh, how we as a Christian community can pray for you? Um, yeah, I, th I think, I think as we're looking forward, we're all getting the feeling, and I don't mean just us in the hospital, but all of us getting the feeling that the line that we've been looking for keeps retreating. Does that make sense? You know, yes. we, we think, is the lockdown going to end? When will we be back to normal? And the more we hear the politicians talk, and the more we look at the reality, the more we think there is a new normal, at least for a period of time. And um, we may be in this for the long haul. So mm. the expectation is that even if lockdowns gradually ease and we, we move back to a way of life that we recognise as slightly more normal, that actually COVID is going to be with us for quite a long time yeah. and the implications of it could be around for months, even years. Um, so as we're adjusting to not having some of our team around and others of us unable to do perhaps what we'd like to do or not own the freedom to do that, 
we're really needing to think about how we make the service sustainable, how we how we look at our rotors, how we look at our timetabling so that we give the best possible cover to the hospital, but mm. also keep the few chaplains who are working well. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we're not immune from the emotional pressures ourselves. We're not immune from the um, the stresses. We, we're also in that place, but we're, we're soaking up a lot of that emotional um, pain with patients mm. and staff and colleagues uh, and the community. But it, it's how we how we stay sustainable, how we uh, self-care so that we can continue to care for others. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking without any conclusions at the moment about the sort of rotors we might work going forward, how we might cover uh, seven days a week rather than um, taking the weekends, um, how we remain available for the crisis moments, Mm -hmm. and then how we gradually get back into supporting wards and at the ICU and A&E and places like that, uh, that we're having to slightly distance from because of the, the conditions, um, how and when we can be much more supportive to them. Okay. And I think the other biggie is, is this sort of potential tidal wave of mental health issues that, that we fear is coming. Yeah. Um, there was a, a thing on the BBC from Italy earlier today. Some some of you uh, folks may have seen it, um, and they were talking about the enormous um, mental health impact of lockdown, and uh, you know not just on medical staff but on, on everybody, and and the the, the overwhelming um, number of uh, mental health cases that they're struggling with there. And the warning was, this is coming your way. You know, it, it's happening in Italy now, but but it's not far away for the rest of Europe. And I think um, we're seeing that not just that there will be PTSD in the future, but we're almost sensing pre-TSD, if that makes sense. So pre-traumatic stress that people are already beginning to struggle. The pain is already biting. So we're we're trying to look with with staff at the hospital and within our own resources about how how we speak into and help people with uh, mental health issues with psychological issues and stress and anxiety um, that's building up. It's so important, those things that you've raised. And yeah, it's, it's vital, yeah. And we appreciate it, Peter. We really do. Yeah. For, for those that are, are, are kind of moving slightly beyond uh, maybe the hospital to tap into your uh, deep theologian's brain, as I know you, <laughs> you have, uh, those pool, that pool of wisdom, um, for those that might be struggling with this, where is God in the midst of this? How, how you know, it's a question wow. people are going to be asking. Only this week, the Google uh, search results news was out. I don't know if you saw that when they said that more and more people, uh, there's been a spike in those asking about what prayer is and how do we pray. And yeah. uh, and so it seems like there's a, a live question of where is God in this? How how you know how as Christians might we respond to those kind of questions? Yeah, and I, I it, it's a huge question. I think there's a scale or range of answers that people perhaps lean towards um mm. and um you know one end of that scale one point on that scale there's the this is god's judgment kind of answer and a lot of people struggle with that and don't and don't want to go there um and yet when you look at our world and you look at the way god used um situations you know in the old testament particularly to to bring his to get his people's attention to 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 strike at the heart of their greed or their their idolatry or something it, it's it's not unknown and it may be that god is at work in this uh i'm, I'm hesitating to say god did it but the god is at work in it and will use this to to cause his people to think and reflect to repent to use the old-fashioned word to mm. um to consider our ways to consider how we use uh, the resources of our planet how we treat our fellow man um to make us think about what's important and so on so this this crisis is is bringing us to the end of ourselves a bit and and making us aware of our frailty and our smallness in the scheme of things and how quickly that which we feel secure in can be snatched away so at the very least i can see that god can use a crisis like this to Mm. touch hearts to speak things in and to bring about remarkable shift and and we see some of that in our society right now and the responses we're seeing the generosity welling up the uh, captain tom and you know wonderful things like that happening but at the same time we see a little core of selfishness that worries us 
yeah. I was talking to a, a colleague at the hospital today, uh, one of our uh, younger porters and uh, a very reflective young man. And he, you know, we were talking about things going back to normal. And he's, he, he's, he was saying, I rather fear it will, that actually people will forget very quickly once we feel we're out of the woods or the fear factor has gone, we'll be right back where we were. I mean, the other the other side of that question of, of where is God in it is is much more the redemptive mm. response. The the Romans eight twenty eight in all things God works for the good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Uh, but I think that's a faith challenge for us. Is it, it's not it's not hey God's going to turn it around and everything's going to be fine. It's okay God, how do we work with you? How do you work with us mm. to bring about good out of this? So that we're not saying coronavirus is good. But we believe that God can bring good even from uh, a crisis and a pandemic like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think I think there's a faith response from us that's required, an engagement with the Spirit, engagement with with the heart of the Father, an engagement with um, the heart of His Son and the, the 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 love of Jesus for His people, for the planet, for the the world around us. Um, and sorry, I just just add one more thing. You can tease out more if you like, if you like, but. Um, we're we're an incredible global community mm. and a lot of the responses the sort of knee-jerk responses really need to be reflected on so you know i've been thinking about this whole crisis making us question what's really important what's mm. what's really needed and so on yeah. but we have to be hesitant and careful about how we respond to those things and prayerful about it so for example i might say well you know, I've not been to a Starbucks for six weeks and I've not used a coffee shop. But, you know, I really like my coffee shops, but I've realized that uh, that's not essential. Yeah. But of course, I know that if I stop drinking coffee and if we all do and we stop using the coffee shops, there are Brazilians and Colombians and Kenyans whose livelihoods are going to go. Right down down the, yeah. down the pan. You know, we're very connected globally, aren't we? Yeah. So somehow I think we've got to reflect on what's important, but it's also about how we enjoy the things we enjoy so if i like to wear nice clothes i'm going to be concerned about where they come from and how the workers are treated who produce them and what what conditions they work in mm. whether the the farmer is getting fair trade rates for his crops and so on and so forth those issues i think need to come back to the fore but isn't it amazing seeing the pictures of uh delhi without yeah, the smoke, the clean the skies the lack of pollution yes. It's yeah. breathtaking, yeah. and it almost feels as though the natural world is saying, "We could have done fine without you." Yeah, uh, you need to think about what you're doing to the planet. We can't escape that, can we? No. But issues of justice, issues of uh, how we're treating people groups—they're massive questions, Peter, aren't they? They are, and it's funny. I, I think you must have been watching one of my uh, Holy Week reflections because I picked up on that that same uh, question of, of being more discerning in, in where we spend our money yeah. and the, the kind of um, uh, retailers, the kind of uh, online suppliers that we choose to shop with, so that we're making a stand and yeah. and doing some bit, being a bit more responsible for you know where our money goes. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you, you mentioned earlier. Um, you said a couple of things. One was about um, will, we, will things go back to normal, and and then you, you mentioned uh, the gentleman that you spoke to who said, oh, you know, I fear they will. Um, I, I, I share that concern um, yes. Yes. because I think that you're absolutely right in saying that there's things that we need to learn that demands a, a response. And uh, to go back to the, um, the issue of applause, uh, that, that, you know, that, that yes. response, public response, uh, and I think it feels like we, we find ourselves as, as communities participating in these things because we feel helpless to do anything else. Uh, and it, it, gives, it gives us something to do, doesn't it? It gives us a connection. It does, and it's kind of... In the absence of action, it, it kind of it's a mark of solidarity, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and and we've seen it. It's be, it's kind of become increasingly common. I mean, I, I can think back to um, the uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks and the J Sui Charlie hashtag that went around online, and and Facebook people changed their profile picture or put a flag on it or whatever in response yeah. to, to to a terrorist attack or whatever. And but how can we looking forwards? There seems to be such a a surge in goodwill and in gratitude to the NHS in particular. Yeah, that's this yeah. reminder of how integral it is to not just our national life but our identity as as British people. Yes. How how can we kind of 
not return to the old way of things? Are there ways that we can kind of, do you think, as particularly as Christians, respond to that and say, look, I need to, we need to make sure that we don't go back to the old norm. There needs to be a new normal. I think one of the things I'm reflecting on is the need to ask the right kind of questions, mm. to dig a little deeper. We're very good at knee-jerk reactions, and the, the social media age yeah. um, gets us clicking like very fast and changing the background, putting a tricolour behind our image on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I confess I've done that, mm. and sometimes I've done it and then looked a little deeper and thought, hang on a minute, I'm not sure. I what really have I just done? Yeah, yeah. And what am I really agreeing with and what lies behind that campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So digging a little deeper. Mm. So, you know, my example about the coffee is is not just because I like a nice coffee, yeah. but it, it's just realising that, um, that I'm part of a global community mm. and there's actually, there actually may not be a great deal wrong with enjoying a nice coffee and affording it, but I really want to care that the people I'm getting it from are being properly looked after and not exploited. So you know that would be that would be an example so the willingness to pay more for things so that others are, are properly rewarded for their labor that kind of choice so i think it's not a it's not just a kind of i'm not going there i'm not going to do that anymore but if i continue doing this then i'm going to look look at the issues carefully and think i'm going to be a responsible agent in in the, in the planet as it were mm. and it's about doing the full research and pushing our governments and speaking up to get them to go for the very best they can and to go for the technologies that are not exploitative mm. and that are not harming the poor. So I think there's a heart to respond, mm. but we need to do our homework and not just jump on bandwagons. Um, mm. Some of them are very, very unhelpful and it pays us just to hesitate and to you know, consider and to weigh. And when we make our political decisions, mm. um, the one thing I'm finding again and again is I can't be a one issue voter. However much I might say this group stand for such and such a moral value or whatever. I need to look at everything they stand for. I need to weigh the whole picture. I need to look at uh, at all of their values and, and where they connect with kingdom values and so on. So mm -hmm. it, it honestly takes some work, doesn't it? To, it does. And, and to it, respond well. I think and there's so much theology. There's so much wisdom in what you've said there, I think, in, in, in as much as particularly for, for Christians watching this, that our responsibility is also part of our witness to Jesus. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps we miss that quite often. Uh, we, yeah. we think about witness or we think about um, how we share the gospel and share Jesus as, as conversations where we say to someone, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know what Jesus did? But actually, it, it's this whole, it's a holistic thing it's, a, it's our very being and, and the, these kind of questions are actually crucial in our time of uh, yeah about living lives of witness isn't it and and and, and showing the transforming grace of god and I, I think there are some serious questions about what distinguishes us as christians one of the things i really hope will be a big shift is this spirit of volunteering and generosity mm. i think we've seen it coming for years i know your church pete is involved in food banks um, uh, cap and things like that, uh, Christians Against Poverty. I think it's tremendously important that Christians are at the forefront of thoughtful responses to need. But at the same time, we do need some voices who are able to speak into how, how do we change the big picture so yeah. that there aren't people who need us to uh, feed their kids, that they're properly provided for, properly looked after. How do we, you know, how do we address a broken welfare system yeah. And it is arguably it's it's a mess, and uh, you know it, it's muddled, and politicians are, are trying to work it out, and nobody seems to have uh, the whole answer. Um, and I think the big big picture, and it is massive, and I don't have the brain power or the wisdom to know how to solve it. But there is this huge uh, issue of inequality mm. that that desperately needs addressing. And the knee-jerk things, and I'm going to say this as somebody who works in the NHS, you know, I'm a rev, but I'm, I'm employed by the, the James Paget Hospital, and I'm an NHS employee. Um, but, you know, I saw something today, you know, a, a kind of a petition to give everybody in the NHS a 5% pay rise. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to chuck it away, but I don't need it. To be honest, please don't quote me too far, folks, on that. But I don't need it. You heard um, it here first. <laughs> it, 
you know, with all the best will in the world, it's a knee-jerk reaction, isn't it? Hey, they've done a great job. Let's pay them all 5% more. Yeah. But actually, there are far bigger uh, issues to do with proper provision for our NHS yeah. going forward. It, it's something like that is a gesture. But I, I heard it said earlier this week that um, uh, we're not all in the same boat. We're, we're, all, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And, and I think that's, um, that's true just as much in the NHS as it is, you know, in society at large. Um, yes, yeah. Danny, I, I, I'm so grateful that you've carved out a bit of time for us. Especially, I know you've had a really tough day today, so I, I'm especially grateful that you still um, decided to uh, stay up and not not snooze on the sofa, but sit there and have a chat with me instead. Um, so I just really want to thank you for that, and just be assured that not just our church at Park, but the, the, the whole Christian community at Great Yarmouth uh, and, and the whole borough of Yarmouth. Um, are remembering all the workers at the uh, pageant uh, and particularly at the moment um, the, the chaplaincy team and, and the prayer requests that you've shared today. Thank you, Peter. It's lovely to talk to you and uh, my love to you and Claire and Mia and uh, please give our love to the church and the, the, the fellowships in Great Yarmouth and I hope we're going to be working together again soon, my friend. <laughs>